Well, welcome back to, to our Bible study. We're continuing in our Bible study of studying the life of Christ. Uh, we have went over the last few weeks the background information, uh, the history and the government of Rome, the religious setting of New Testament Palestine, the morality of the Roman Empire. We talked about those things in lesson one. In lesson two, we talked about the pre-existence of Christ and the fact that Christ existed before he came here on earth in flesh and blood, right? Yes, sir. We talked about that. We talked about his ancestry and we talked about his divinity, that he's 100 percent God, but 100 percent man at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. So we talked about that in lesson three. We talked about the announcement that was made to Zacharias, the announcement that was made to Mary. And then we talked about the birth of John the Baptist. We talked about those things and how he came in on the John the Baptist was the forerunner for Christ, right? Mm -hmm. He was the voice crying out where in the, in the wilderness, in the wilderness. Well, from there, we continue with the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We then fast forward it 12 years after his birth and he had a visit in where Jerusalem. When he was in Jerusalem, mom and daddy couldn't find him, right? And where was he at? In the temple. And we remember him saying in the temple that he must be about whose business? His father's business. And from this point forward, we see him being about no other business but his father's business. So we went his visit to Jerusalem. We talked about John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ and preaching in the wilderness. We talked about the baptism of Christ. And at the baptism of Christ, that's the first time that we see at one time all three of the Godhead together because Jesus Christ, the son of God, is present. You hear a voice from heaven. The father said, this is my son in whom I'm I'm well pleased. And then something descended like a dove. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so we see the three essence of the Godhead together at, we, at the baptism of Jesus. After Jesus was baptized. He was led into the, into, by the Spirit into the wilderness, and when he was in the wilderness, what happened? He was, he was tempted by Satan. And we know whenever you have a mountaintop experience with God, know that Satan's going to try to take you into the valley. And that's exactly what he did with, with Christ. We then went to the beginning of his earthly ministry. He started his earthly ministry. Christ calls his first disciples. We went to the first miracle that took place when Jesus turned water into wine. turned water into wine. After Jesus turned water into wine, we talked about he went to his father's house and in his father's house, money changers have corrupted it and that they were doing illegal activity and illegally taxing people and profiting off of the people. And so he drives out the money changers. He turns over the tables in the bit in the uh, temple and said, you've turned my house, this house of prayer into a den of into a den of thieves. He continues with his earthly ministry. He has an interview with Nicodemus. We find out with that interview with Nicodemus that you have to be born again. again in order to inherit the kingdom of God. Not just the physical birth, but the spiritual birth. You have to be born again. Then we walk through the beginning of his Judean ministry. Jesus withdraws from Judea. He talks to the woman at Jacob's well. Then we move to him talking with the woman at Jacob's well to the healing of the nobleman's son. His ministry moved to Capernaum. Then Jesus calls four disciples. Who were the four disciples? Again? James and John, son of thunder, and Andrew and, and Peter. Right. Um, Jesus then delivers a man who's possessed with a demon. And then he goes on a healing tour throughout Galilee. After his healing tour throughout Galilee, we find that he calls Matthew. And Matthew is a? Tax collector. He calls Levi, who's Matthew, a tax collector. And that shows us that Matthew threw a party. And as he threw a party and invited all these other sinners to come in, he wanted them to be saved as well. Amen. And if God is able to say, save a tax collector that was taxing his own people and was doing mean and ruthless things, it shows us God is able to save anybody. And we ought to be going out and inviting others just like Matthew did. We need to go out and invite others to come and learn more about Christ. Then after he called Matthew, the Pharisees started questioning Jesus. And there were questions that came about from John the Baptist followers as well about fasting. And they wanted to know why is it that 
we have to fast, but your disciples are not fasting at this time and moment. And Jesus was letting them know who he was and explaining to him, them the importance of fasting and saying that even if, if, if you have a, um, a marriage and in that wedding, um, people are fasting. Because there's a wedding ceremony for an entire week, you're exempt from fasting. Why? Because the groom had a party and it's a part of the, part of the process. After the wedding ceremony is over, or the wedding, because um, the ceremony was for about a week, after it was over, then they went back to the practice of fasting. Jesus is saying, I'm the groom, I'm here. So they don't have to fast right now because I'm with them, but the time will come when they are able to fast. And so he was making it plain to them. Now we're moving on to lesson eight, and we're continuing the great ministry in Galilee. Now, the first thing we're going to deal with is the first Sabbath day controversy. You know, people love controversies, don't they? And we're going to find that as Jesus was going through his ministry, controversy followed him as well. It's in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 47. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 47. I'm not going to go through all those scriptures so you can follow along with your Bible, but we're going to be in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 47, dealing with the first Sabbath day controversy. Here we come to the end. We've come to the end of the first year of Jesus' ministry. We've come to the end of that. And the first part of the year, Jesus spent his ministry in Jerusalem and in Judea. That's where he spent the first part of, of his ministry. And this was due large and in part because of there was friction. He was trying to do ministry in Jerusalem and in Judea, and the Pharisees were tripping. And there was friction that was there. So then what did Jesus do? Jesus said, I'm going to continue to be about my father's business. I'm coming here to minister to you, but there's other people that still need to hear the word of God. And so he continued his mission. So he spent the remaining of his years, uh, the remainder of this year, in Galilee with his disciples. Now, as Jesus was preaching and as he was teaching, his fame was spreading throughout Galilee. It was spreading. And so what do you think happened as his fame is spreading? What do you think happened with the Pharisees, the religious leaders? How do you think they reacted to Jesus's fame? They hated it. Yep, they hated it. They were jealous. They start spewing venom on him. Start talking about him, and you're going to see even laying traps for him. Because this second year that we're going into with Jesus' ministry, because now we're entering into the second year of his ministry, it's going to be intense. And as it's intense, his ministry is going to continue to grow. His fame is going to continue to grow. And the opposition is going to continue to grow as well. Nearly all of the second year, of Jesus's ministry because again that's where we're entering into now his second year is going to be spent in Galilee with the exception of one event and that was the Passover feast that took place in Jerusalem and it was at this Passover feast in Jerusalem where he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda and that's what we're going to be looking at um, in John chapter chapter 5. The gospel writer John John is the only gospel writer to give an account of the healing of this paralyzed man in Jerusalem in, in chapter 5. And it happened at a place called, in Hebrew it was called Bethesda, uh, Bethesda. It was called Bethesda. And this pool, this pool of Bethesda you see, it was a pool and it had porches. So there were five porches that were surrounding it. Jesus knew that at this pool, he knew that there was a man at the pool who needed help. Jesus knew he needed help. And you know what this tells me? No matter where we are, Jesus sees you. No matter where you are, Jesus sees you. Wherever I am, Jesus sees me. And he knows all about our needs. And not only does he know about our needs, but he's ready to intercede and help us to meet our needs. And that is something all of us need to be able to shout about and be thankful for no matter where you are. If you've been, this man was laying down for 38 years by the pool. Jesus walked, knew where he was there and he knew where the man was. 
He saw him, knew his needs, and met his needs, and that's what he's able to do with us as well. Jesus had ignored this man's past disappointments, and look at what Jesus says. John chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Then Jesus said to him what? He said to the paralyzed man, what did Jesus say to him? He looked at him and said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And what happened in verse 9? At once, at once, he was what? And he picked up his what? You know what this tells me? Um, wherever you lay your bed, that's where your home is. Wherever you make your bed, that's where your home is. This man's bed was made by the pool of Bethesda. He was in a dark, dismal, depressing state, and that's where his bed was. That's where his home was. But guess what? This man now no longer would be sleeping in a place of despair. Why? Because of his encounter with Christ, he's now going to be moving and his situation was going to be changed. And whenever it is that we connect with Christ, no matter how long you've been in that dark, dismal place, this man was there for 38 years. Jesus was able to speak to him and his situation was able to change. And whatever situation you're in, if you will just connect with Christ, he's able to change your situation. Even if you've been laying in this place for all those years, he can change your location just like that. Amen. He's able. He's able. And you know what? This was a miraculous healing. And people ought to be excited and shouting about this man who was down for 38 years now is able to pick up his own mat and walk. walk. But there was a problem that took place. This took place. When this happened, it happened on what day? The day? On the Sabbath day. Now, this wasn't a problem for Jesus, but it was a problem for the religious leaders. It was a problem for them. It was a problem for them. Why? Because they see this man carrying his mat. They see him, they see him picking up the mat and carrying it. And the religious leaders said that was work. Him picking up his mat and carrying it, it was work because it was on the Sabbath. So what did they do? They rebuked the man. And this is what they did. This is interesting. They took a divine command and not operating on the Sabbath that provided physical rest for humans. This was the, the Sabbath was to provide physical rest for humans from their, from their uh, work. And it, they erroneously turned it into a human restriction on acts of mercy. The Sabbath was created so that we would not have to work and we could be able to, to rest for God's people. They then misinterpreted the law and turned it into a human restriction because having mercy on somebody you can't do that either on the Sabbath, even if it means you heal them so that they can get up and walk. So they approached the man. And as they approached the man, the Pharisees, they gave him a warning. They gave him a warning saying that it's not lawful for him to carry his pallet on the Sabbath. That's what they said. And look at what Jesus' response is. Jesus' response. John chapter 5, verse 11. But he replied. The man, they're talking to the man, telling him it's a sin for you. You're sinning on the Sabbath. He replied, the man who made me well said to me. Who's he talking about? Who's the man that made him well? Jesus. Jesus. He said to me, what? Pick up, pick up your mat and walk. He said, pick up your mat and walk. And you know what this tells me? This tells me that, that this man preferred to listen to the one who had power rather than somebody just practicing religion. And we need to listen to the one who has miraculous power, being Christ Jesus, than listen to folks that just plan and practicing religion. This man had been there 38 years, y'all. And 38 years, the Pharisees have been walking by him at the pool, looking at him, knew, but never tried to help him. Never tried to help him. Then this unknown healer comes and, and tells him to carry his mat, and they want to get 
upset because he helped the one that they've been overlooking for 38 years. There's no question about who this man was going to listen to. He said, I'm not going to listen to y'all who walked by me for 38 years. I'm going to listen to the one who told me to get up and take my mat. And you know what this tells me? We need to listen to Jesus. We need to listen to Jesus because he's the one who's able to change our lives. We need to have our spiritual eyes and ears open at all times to hear what God is saying to us. Yes, it's good for us to connect with other people of godly wisdom and talk with them and pray with them. But ultimately, we need to hear from who? We need to hear from him. We need to he hear from, from him. Later on in the chapter, see, the Pharisees are getting mad, y'all, and, and anger's building. And again, this is a journey that we're going through with the life of Christ, his journey to the cross. This is his journey to the cross. So later in John chapter 5, at verse 17, we find Jesus in the temple. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day. And I, too, am what? Working. Am working. We find in the temple that this is where Jesus identified himself as the one who had healed the, paral the uh, paralyzed man. And it's here that he referred to himself as, or referred to God as his father. So Jesus is now beginning to tell them who he is. He's beginning that process. And look at the reaction of the Pharisees once he starts telling them who he really is. Verse 16, John chapter 5, verse 16. So because Jesus was doing these things on the? The what? So he's doing things and showing acts of kindness and mercy on the Sabbath. He helped somebody that they overlooked for 38 years. So they get jealous and get mad and they begin to persecute him. But then it goes a little bit further in verse 18, John chapter five, verse 18. For this reason, the who the tried. What's all the harder mean? I mean, they, they went out, they, they took it to all extents. Yeah, to all extents. They went to new levels. Yeah. They went to new levels. Yeah. They wouldn't go sleep until he was dead. Right. And they wouldn't sleep until they persecuted him. It was to yeah. kill him, kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself what? Equal to making himself equal to God. So you see they're getting more and more angry and you see the tensions building. And now you're starting to see the reason why Jesus was crucified. You're starting to see the true reasons behind he went to he laid down his life on the cross. Jesus went on to say to them. These are just the beginning of my mighty works. He's saying, I'm just getting started. Look at what he says in John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus is talking to them. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and. Okay, stop there. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. Who sent him? God the Father. Has what? eternal life and will be condemned he has from what some death to life he's trying to tell them who he is once again he's trying to educate them since they are um, masters quote unquote of the law he's trying to let them know this is me who had been prophesied about now look at what he says in verse 25 I tell you the truth a time is coming and has now come when the what? He's letting them know even those who had died under the law, when they hear the voice of the Son of God and those who believe, they too will be able to, to live and have eternal life. He's just trying to let them know who he is. Then he continues on in verses 26 and 27. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life. He's showing them, I am God. I'm showing him he is my Father. I am divine. 
Then in verse 27, he says, and he, the father, has given him authority to do what? Because he is the son of man. Jesus is telling them what? Who he is. And demonstrating through this word the power and authority that was given to him by his father. It wasn't about him. It was about what had been given to him from his father father so Jesus he anticipated they were going to continue to question because the Pharisees continued to have questions and more questions and more questions so since he um, anticipated this he says I'm gonna give you some other witnesses since you're Pharisees you studied the law you know the law of Moses let me give you some word to back up what I'm saying so look at what Jesus does he presents five different witnesses five different accounts John chapter 5, verse 33. You have sent to John, this is John the Baptist, and he has testified to the what? To the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mentioned it that you might be saved. Job was a? So Jesus is saying this is fulfillment of Scripture. John the Baptist, he was the one who came and testified about the truth of Jesus Christ. He was the forerunner. John was a shining lamp that burned and gave light. Remember, he's the one who said, repent and be baptized. He's the one who said, when Jesus asked him to baptize him, I'm not worthy to even unlace your shoes, let alone baptize you. You ought to be baptizing me. Yet John was the one who was used by God to actually dip deep Jesus in the water and bring him back up. And he's saying, you heard his testimony and believe the light. He said, so don't just believe my testimony, believe what John said. This is another account, another witness. Believe John. Here's the second thing he said. Verse 36, I have testimony weightier than that of John for the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing testifies that the Father has sent what? There's a greater witness, he said, than John that testified to Jesus' identity. And you know what that was? The miraculous things he had done. Look at the miraculous things that he had done. That was evidence. That was evidence that he was sent from the Father. So in essence, Jesus is telling them, you know what? My deeds validate what I've done and what I'm telling you who I am. So John has told you who I am and you will believed in him. But he told you who I am, but you're not believing. My works I've showed you is a witness to tell you I've been sent from God. What else do I need to do? So he continues talking. He's like, what else? I got? He said, so I'm going to show you some more stuff. He said, and the father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his what? The father testified about Jesus. The religious leaders have rejected him. They, they didn't have God's word residing in them because they didn't believe his son. They did not believe. They did not believe his son. So Jesus says, I got to take it even a step further for you. I'm trying to tell you and educate you about who I am because I want I don't want anyone to perish. I'm trying to tell you who I am. Verse 39. You diligently, Pharisees, study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about who? They thought they had eternal life because they studied the scriptures. They thought they had eternal life because they studied the scriptures. Yet those very scriptures pointed directly to Christ. They pointed directly to Christ, but they refused to go to him to have life. But they studied the scripture. And this tells me that a person can study the written word and still miss Jesus, the living word. 
A person can study the word. That's why there are people who are theologians because they can study, but they may not be true believers because they may not believe what it is they're studying. They're theologians and they understand theology and they understand religion, but they don't they don't understand the one who the theology is written to be able to reveal. So they study and study and study and still miss Christ and still miss Christ. That's why when you hear about uh, theology, it's the study of religion. It's not about us and what we believe. It's religion. You can study all different types of religion and they call it theology. So we think about being believers in Christ. We want to make sure as we study the written word, we don't miss the living word. We don't miss the living word because knowing God's written word is absolutely essential. To know the word of God is essential. The word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our pathway. We ought to study and meditate on the word of God day and night. But if your knowledge doesn't leave you, lead you to the, the living word, then we've completely missed the point. Yes. For what? Oh, who's your daddy? <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, who's your daddy? You don't put the pressure on now. She don't put the pressure on. Who's your daddy? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. That is. That's a good one. That's that is. Could you think about it? Who is our father? Who is our daddy? That's. Thank you, Sister Cooper. But she just turned that heat up a little bit now. She turned that heat up a little bit. Uh, well, Jesus, can, he continues because he's saying who he is. And look at what he says in verse 45. But do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Don't think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom your hopes are set. Once again, he's writing, I mean, he's speaking to Pharisees who studied the law of Moses. So now he's saying for you to understand who I am, let me take you back to Moses whom you believe. Don't think I will accuse you before the father. Your accuser is Moses on whom your hopes are set. And if you believed Moses, you would what? Believe you would believe me for he also what? Moses. Jesus told the, the, the religious leaders he wouldn't be their, their accuser. Instead, instead, it would be, be Moses, the very person whose words they were reading in the Old Testament would accuse them before God because they had not learned from him. That would be the accuser. And if you believe Moses, you, you would believe me. Um, Moses, Jesus told them, wrote about everything that pointed directly to who? Jesus. To him. All those writings pointed directly to him. He said, but since you do not believe what he wrote, since you don't believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? <laughs> now, Moses authored the, the um, books from Genesis, to Deuteron Genesis and Deuteronomy, right? He, he wrote those. He wrote the first uh, four books of the Bible, four, five, the Pentateuch. Um, and Moses wrote about the Passover lamb. He wrote about the Passover lamb. They studied. They knew that Moses wrote about the Passover lamb. John the Baptist called Christ the lamb of God. They believed Moses and the Passover lamb. They believed John the Baptist when he says, behold, look, the lamb of God. Moses said that God would raise up a prophet like him from among God's people. That prophet was Christ in his human form. But the religious leaders were not willing to believe the very things that they had been studying, even though he's standing right in front of them. And that's what Jesus was pointing out to them. That's what he is. This making sense. Yeah. They read Moses, but they weren't paying attention to him. <laughs> they weren't paying attention to him. So that was the first Sabbath day controversy. That was the first one. But then we got another set the second Sabbath day controversy. And this is going to be found in Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. 
Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. And Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. And those individual scriptures should be listed on your, your handout. And I'm going to be going through some of those um, important scriptures as we, as we go through this. Um, but Jesus had, had pretty much um, wrecked the, thought of, uh, the thoughts of the Pharisees. He just broke them down, didn't he? From what we just talked about, he broke them down and gave them um, an education about him being 100% divine and 100% man. He talked about his authority and his deity. So he pretty much answered their questions and wrecked their thoughts about what that could mean and, and whether or not he was, he was God. So the Pharisees stopped questioning because they knew they couldn't hang with him. They couldn't question. So now they do something else. They decide to accuse him of being the Sabbath law breaker at the very next opportunity. The very next opportunity. I can't beat you with the word. So now I'm going to start trying to point out some flaws in you. Doesn't that sound familiar? When some folks want to argue with you and learn they can't beat you in arguing, so then they start pointing things out about you. And so that's exactly what they are trying to do to Christ. And this first opportunity is in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. He went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were what? They were hungry, and they begin to what? He began, so they picked some heads of grain and started eating them. What happened in verse 2? What just happened there? Now, the Pharisees, they, they're known for their knowledge of the word of God. And their love for rules. They, they are, they're known for that and, and for their rules. And when they saw Jesus' disciples picking grain and eating them on the Sabbath, they said, you are breaking the law. Yes. Is that like, like the guy picking up the mat? You're saying it was. Because yeah, they're doing the, they, yep. they say that they're doing work too. Yeah. Well, this is more than just doing work. <laughs> it, it is for what they're saying. Because um, you couldn't, that's a good question, you could not work on the Sabbath, but the Pharisees created all these other crazy rules and crazy regulations um, and so many different scenarios on how the Sabbath could be handled. They started confusing folks, but they considered the disciples' actions equivalent to working on the grain fields. So they, they thought this was the same. And this is... Not, well, I mean, they have been plotting against Jesus, so now they got spy, uh, uh, spies everywhere. And then once they get a chance to talk to him in the temple and when he's there, then they start asking questions. But now they're telling Jesus the Pharisees had saw what happened in the grain fields. And as they saw what happened on the grain field and that they were hungry, they then, as soon as they got the opportunity, said, look, Jesus, you sinning, dude. Your disciples are doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath. They following you. And they're doing what's unlawful on, on the Sabbath. That's right. Well, when, 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 when is the Sabbath? Well, I mean, when, you know, some people celebrate Saturdays and Sundays. Well, in the, on the Hebrew calendar, it would equate to Saturday as being the Sabbath day. Okay. You know, it, this, the Sabbath day is not on Sunday. That's something that took place when organized religion came about. And they chose to be able to move worship to um to Sundays, but the Sabbath day historically, and when you go back to where it was in ancient history and during the time of a Jew, it was on Saturday. Sabbath. Yeah, that's the Sabbath. That's the Sabbath. So, so they saw that. And now this is what's interesting. So they say you're breaking the law, but then some have said, weren't the disciples stealing too? <laughs> so you're not only breaking the law, but now you are stealing. And you know what? If it was our culture, Today, in 2024, it would be stealing because I can't go over to your house and start eating off your apple tree. I can't go to your house and start picking your carrots. I can't go and get your cabbage and just start eating. I can't do that. You know, I would be stealing. But you know what? The law of Moses, and this is what is messed up. The law of Moses, which they studied, they studied, they knew. 
They knew the law. Y'all, it provided for such things because a hungry person could go to a grain field or to a vineyard and be able to eat till their heart's content. But there were some restrictions. So I can go to your house and glean from your field. But here's the restrictions in the law of Moses. And the Pharisees knew this. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 24. If you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat all the grapes you want, but you can't take none and put them in the basket and take them home. You can get what you need for that day because there was a community helping one another. So you could get what you needed for that day. You just couldn't try to store stuff up and take it away because it was designed so no one would be without. Okay. That's what they provided for each other. And then it wasn't just grapes. In verse 25, if you enter your neighbor's grain field, you can pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle and try to sickle it um, to standing grain. That means you can eat the little kernels, but you can't cut down the stalks and take the stalks home with you. And that's what they were doing, right? Was the they was eating the little kernels. <laughs> so you see how they're trying to pick apart? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you see what's happening. So Jesus then goes on to say, look, I need to justify you the picking of grain, and I need to educate you about how ignorant you are about Scripture. <laughs> that's what Jesus is saying. Because he reminded them of in the Old Testament of how David ate the shoe bread for strength. The bread that was in the tabernacle that only the priest could eat. And this is what he shows. He said, let me remind you that David ate the, the, the shoe bread for strength. I'm not going to do 1 Samuel. I'm just going to go to, to Matthew chapter 12, um, verse 3. This is how Jesus answered them. Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? Haven't you read? You read. It's in 1 Samuel. Y'all y'all uh, studies of the law, Pharisees. Did you not read that? David and his companions were hungry. He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the what? ate the consecrated bread which was not lawful for them to do but only for the but only for for the priest y'all David was hungry he was a man after God's own heart the the laws are set to provide instruction for us to keep but it should never take you away from the mercy that should be exhibited on mankind and this okay then I gotta, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm getting excited, y'all. Verse 5. Or haven't you read in the law on the Sabbath, the priest in the temple desecrate what? Jesus reminded them of this. The priests, they violate the Sabbath all the time. How? They working on the Sabbath day. <laughs> it, are they working? On the Sabbath day, yet they are innocent. And, and, and he reminded them that they have God's work to do, but the Pharisees were legalists. And this reminds us, whenever God's commands prevent you from loving and serving God, you are using his commands inappropriately. We're using them inappropriately. The work of the priests were justified in the service of the temple. So they were justified because they're working in the temple. So Jesus says that his disciples were even more justified in their service and work for him on the Sabbath. So just as the priests were justified, my disciples are justified because they're working for me. And he has already shared with them that he is divine, that he is divine. Why? Verse 6, he says, this is why I tell you that. Because I tell you that one greater than the temple is what? Here. Is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would, have, you would not have condemned the what? Yeah. Then this is the kicker. For what? He dropped the mic. That's what Jesus did. Something greater than the temple is here. The only thing greater than the temple 
then God's house is God. The only thing greater. And therefore, Jesus was letting them know that I am here. I am God and I'm here and I am the son of man. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And since this is my show, I decide how the Sabbath ought to be observed because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. So he was putting them in their place, but he did it by using scripture because they were Pharisees who knew the law. And he was using the writings of Moses to validate his point. You see why it's important to always back up with scripture? Yes. What's that? He's large and in charge. I got two sermons now. Who's your daddy? Enlarge and in charge. Boy, we're going to have fun. Yes. Drop the mic and drop the mic. We got three new sermons. Hey, we ready to go into May now. <laughs> so this is the second controversy on the Sabbath day. But y'all, they just didn't stop. They kept going. There's a third one. There's a third one. The third Sabbath day controversy. This continues in Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. But it's also in Mark chapter 3 verses 1 through 6, and Luke chapter 6, verse 6 through, through 11. Now, on, a, on another Sabbath day, and it's perhaps just the Sabbath following the grain incident, um, Jesus was now in a synagogue in, in a town outside of Galilee. And while Jesus is there, he noticed a man with a withered hand. He's in the temple, and he notices a man with, with a withered hand. The, the scribes and the Pharisees are all sitting there in the temple and see this man with the withered hand. And they're waiting and watching as you asked, Sister Bernie, um, they're spying on Jesus to see what's he going to do this Sabbath day. You see, he healed on the Sabbath and told the man to pick up his mat and walk. Then he, he had his disciples eating grain on the Sabbath, what's he going to do on this Sabbath day? Because, you know, the other two Sabbath days, he put us in our place with the word. So, so he put us in our place. And it's possible they may have even planted this man there because they were plotting and scheming against Christ because they wanted to, to, to trap them. However, um, in the midst of this serious situation, Jesus thought not of himself or anything negative that could come against him. He wasn't thinking of that. Instead, Luke chapter 6, verse 8. Luke chapter 6, verse 8. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. <laughs> he knew what the Pharisees and the scribes were thinking. And he said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand up in front of everybody. And so what did the man do? Now, knowing the thoughts of the Pharisees, knowing the thoughts of the Pharisees, Look at what Jesus did. Jesus said to them, I asked you, before y'all even start asking me why I did this on the Sabbath, <laughs> let me answer you and help you out. I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to what? Destroy. Destroy. What did Jesus just do? He challenged them. He challenged them, asking them, is it good to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? And this is what his point was. If somebody chose not to do good by allowing someone else to suffer right in front of them, that was evil. That was evil. So he pointed that out to them. He healed the man. And guess what the Pharisees did? They got madder and madder and madder. They got hot. They got hot. They got... Now, they should have been rejoicing because, once again, somebody who could not use their hand. Most people were right-handed. So that means he couldn't write. That means he had trouble trying to eat. That means he had trouble trying to get a job and work and provide for his family. There's so many things he could not do, yet they were going to allow him to stay in that situation. And Jesus said, no, it's more important for me to make sure that I'm doing good and not evil. So they got upset. They were filled with rage and they started plotting against him even more. 
Look at what happened in, in the account what Mark writes about this same account. They got mad and upset. Mark chapter 3, verse 6. In Mark chapter 3, verse 6, then the Pharisees, after he healed the man with the withered hand, went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might what? Immediately they went out. Now, this is what is interesting. Um, the Herodians were political supporters of Herod. Now, they did not like Roman domination of their land. Yet religious, the religious folks and the politics got together to try and take out the king. And this shows that even though you may have, a, even though you may be loyal to fighting against your enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So you have those who were Herodians and the Jewish leaders coming together to come against Jesus, even though the Jewish leaders didn't like the fact that the Romans had persecuted them or had dominance over them. They were so upset with Jesus, who was their own, that they came against the enemy of their enemy because that became their friend so that they could be able to try to kill Jesus. Y'all, whenever you are not following Christ, you would do some crazy things. Mm -hmm. If they would have understood the word and followed the word and what he was saying through his word, they would have had love and compassion and got the fact that he was there with them to bring them eternal life. Yet because they were so wrapped up in other stuff. Um, my mentor, Dr. Troy Ladd, used to say this all the time. Christ is the only thing that keeps me from going crazy. And if you start fighting if you combine with your enemy to fight somebody else that's crazy mm -hmm. but guess what that's what will happen when we're not following Christ that's what will happen and this continued to grow and grow and grow and grow until it finally brings Jesus to the cross and he's plagued by this this whole scheme uh, to the end of his earthly ministry he's plagued by that yes <laughs> you, but in their mind, but in their mind, they weren't going to kill him. They want the Herodians to do it, the Romans to kill him. They were like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not going, I'm not doing it. I'm just, <laughs> yeah, they were, but guess what? I can plot against you, but I didn't carry out the sin. We went to the store together, and we both went to steal the same stuff, but I let you steal it, and I didn't. Then once we get outside, I still share in the spoils, but I didn't steal nothing. <laughs> yes. But didn't they also have, they had David's words, right? From yeah. the, and, and with David, David plotted against and had that man killed on the front line. Yeah, because of his sin. Right. And that's why he could so not build the temple. Been, so that's that been the same as them. That's that's because David didn't kill him. He had him sent to be killed. So they were doing virtually the same thing. They didn't kill Jesus. Right. They were having Jesus sent to be killed. Yep. So yeah. So uh, why wouldn't they have re realized that they were doing the same? Because sin is sin for everybody else but me. <laughs> that's why. There it is. Okay. Sin is sin for everybody else but me. I got you. You know, <laughs> because I'm a Pharisee. I got you. I know the law. And I'm protecting it. And that's why you, I can't even get into all this. When you hear all these holy wars and these fighting, everybody killing in the name of, or in the name of Allah, or in, it's, okay, I got to stop. Because, you know, I might get edited, and next thing you know, we can't get on YouTube no more. <laughs> and they shut us down. Uh, this is the last point, last point we have. Um, Jesus then moves and he teaches and heals by the Sea of, of Galilee. After the third uh, Sabbath day controversy, he withdraws. So it goes to the, to the Sea of Galilee. And the Bible says that um, he went from Jerusalem, um, Idame, Tyre, Sidon, and Galilee, Galilee. So these are all places here that Jesus withdrew and he had people that were following him. 
Now, why is this important that he had people from all these other regions following him? Remember, he went to Jerusalem. He went to Judea. He withdrew from there. There was friction. He withdrew. He then went to Galilee. He ministered to Galilee. Now he goes to Galilee, and they start tripping on him about the Sabbath and the controversies. So now he withdraws again to the Sea of Galilee, and all these other regions, people are following him. Why? Because the message had to continue to go out to others, and the gospel needed to go beyond where he was. There are times when God will allow you to be persecuted, to push you to other areas because he wants your message and your ministry to go beyond where you were comfortable. Mm. To go beyond where you were comfortable. And that's what happened here, um, Matthew chapter 12. What? We're reading this because this is the fulfillment as of the prophecy that was given about Jesus. Matthew chapter 12 about the spreading of the gospel. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I've chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to what? Amen. To the nations. Verse 19. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice or no one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to what? Victory. In his name, the nations will put what? Will put their hope. The ministry would be, was prophesied by Isaiah that the ministry would spread. It would go beyond Jerusalem, beyond Judea, beyond Galilee to all the nations. And you know it what? It was at the Sea of Galilee that Jesus um, uh, had them to catch all those fish and the nets begin to break in the Sea of Galilee. It was in the Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked on water. It was in the Sea of Galilee that, that he said, peace be still and still the storm on the sea. He performed so many miracles on the Sea of Galilee. And that shows that the gospel could spread. Sister Hannington. This, the two fish and, and five loaves of bread? Yes. So you think about all these miracles taking place outside of Jerusalem and Judea. Now, the Sea of Galilee, just so you know, it had some different names too. It was called the Sea of Galilee for the region it was located, but it was called Lake Gennesaret. It was also called the Sea of and also the Sea of, yes. So when you see these names in the Bible, I just want you to know this is all referring to the same lake, the, the, the same sea, uh, or not the lake, the same Sea of Galilee, so that you see that. And again, we're studying his great ministry in Galilee. We're seeing how the religious leaders are building animosity towards Jesus and how, the, how they're getting irritated with them. They're plotting and scheming. They're now getting with the Herodians and trying to set traps for him. And this ultimately leads him to the cross. Well, next week we're going to cover uh, the choosing of the twelve. The choosing of the twelve. And then we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon of the Mount.